back, everyone. This is the Change Log. We're a member supported blog, podcast, and weekly email covering what's fresh and what's new in open source. Check out the blog at thechangelog.com, our past shows at 5x5.tv slash changelog. And you're listening to episode 120. Andrew and I talked to Postmodern about his open source projects, CH Ruby, Ruby Install, CH Gems, Ronin, and more. Today's show is sponsored by Ninefold, Codeship, and New Relic. We'll tell you a bit more about Codeship and New Relic later in the show, but Ninefold is our, our first sponsor. They're a high-performance platform for deploying and hosting Ruby on Rails applications. The platform is built on Ninefold's own infrastructure with servers in U.S. and Asia Pacific. Because Ninefold owns the entire stack, from the hardware up, they provide you with quantifiably superior performance compared to the competition with more economical scaling. Ninefold makes it extremely easy to deploy your Rails application straight from your Git repo by either using the online wizard or the command line interface. Ninefold also offers great support, zero downtime deployment, SSL, Redis, Memcache, load balancers, and firewalls for free straight out of the box. Experience Ninefold superior performance and easy deployment with a 30-day free trial. Just visit ninefold.com to sign up. And now, on to the show. Welcome back, everybody. We are joined today by Postmodern to talk about CH Ruby or Truby. Um, not really sure the correct pronunciation there. We'll let Postmodern give us the definitive answer at some point. Uh, Ronin, CH Gems, and a number of other projects that uh, Postmodern has been working on. So to get started here, why don't you give us an introduction of kind of who you are and where you come from and projects that you're working on? Hello, um, I'm Postmodern. Uh, I write a lot of Ruby by trade. Um, kind of uh, CH Ruby and Ruby install were kind of more recent projects I wrote just out of uh, sheer need of them. So it's it's not like a, a real passionate kind of backgrounds. Um, yeah, so I hail from the, the Pacific Northwest, or Cascadia, as we yeah. like to call it. <laughs> and, Got some friends uh, there. Yep, yep. Uh, it's up in a little, little teeny town, uh, Portland, and uh, kind of native uh, for a long time. But yeah, um, so mostly I do a lot of like security research. I like developing tools and kind of automated attacks. That, that's really what I'm into and tickles my fancy. And like, as I kind of got more into using Ruby forts, I kind of like got into noticing the pain points and I thought, well, you know, I've, I've been working in Ruby for a long time, you know, maybe I could try my hand at actually, you know, fixing some of these or making tools that, uh, kind of like fit, met my needs or, you know, solve my problems. So that's, uh, that's kind of what I've been doing and, you know, yeah. Gotcha. So real quick, um, just to just to kind of get a get an answer here. I've always called it uh, CH root, but I could be wrong. You're the security person. So give us a uh, what do you call it? Do you call it CH root? And then subsequently, do you call it CH Ruby or, or what should we be calling it? Man, so I think it really depends on kind of the, the people or the persons. Um, everyone has their own weird pronunciation of all these Unix utilities. Uh, cause they're kind of like, they were designed to be easy to type out, not really pr- necessarily pronounce. Mm-hmm. And so like I've heard, uh, Chiroots, I've heard CH Roots. Um, there are people actually like, I don't know, I, maybe once I've heard someone say like change roots, actually like spell out the actual word. Mm. So I really don't know. Um, I don't know what the actual pronunciation is and <laughs> I think it's more just like we it's not really necessary to actually say it out loud because we just type it. So it's kind of like one of those things. You're just like, you know, that thing. Yeah, that thing. Yeah. 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 I think I uh, I'll stick with CH Ruby then uh, and, and whatever tickles your fancy, I guess, is the appropriate answer here. In the pre-show, yeah. you mentioned a funny one. What was the funny one that uh, for Linux that that uh, could be said kind of a funny way? Oh, well, um, I don't know. Like, it's kind of a weird thing, like a lot of. Talking to a lot of people, everyone has their own pronunciations, but um, one of my friends was actually a while back doing research into using uh, the UPA-NP protocol or universal plug-and-play protocol, which allows you know, routers to open up ports uh, for services and stuff like that, um, port forwarding. And that. But you can actually use it for punching holes in like you know firewalls on you mm-hmm. know, shitty Netgear routers. But uh, he kept referring to the protocol as like up and up. And so he's like, yeah, I'm looking into this uh, up and up protocol. I'm like, <laughs> what is that? Well, up and up is the protocol that lets you open up ports. Right? It's, it's, <laughs> it's on the up and up. Yeah. 
No, that's awesome. So why don't you, just for everybody that, I don't know, if you work in Ruby and a lot of our uh, listeners do, I'm sure they've heard of RVM or RBM or CHRuby or whatever. So why don't you kind of give us an introduction to just what 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 is CHRuby? What's the reason that it's here? Okay, so... Um... So I, before CHRuby, I actually used RVM a lot, and I used it primarily on kind of like Fedora. That's kind of like my main operating system of choice. Um, before that, uh, basically, I kind of only used actually System Ruby because um, mm-hmm. before that, I was on Gen 2 and actually, no. Um, so kind of a side note is Fedora actually does a really good job of packaging Ruby, and they actually configure it. They configure Ruby gems to install into your local home directory for gems mm-hmm. and, and when you're actually a normal user. And when you root, it installs into USR, local, share, wherever. Um, so it really wasn't necessary to use RVM a lot because a lot of times I was just using the most recent version of Ruby. But, you know, when I actually needed to upgrade and you know test uh, newer versions of 1.9 and 2.0, then I kind of like, okay, I actually started using uh, RVM and it was recommended to a lot of my other uh, friends who were uh, trying to get uh, up to speed in Ruby and so they could help out with like open source projects mm-hmm. and collaborate together. But anyways, um, one of the problems, there's like a lot of the pain points that developed along with using the RVM extensively for a long time. And one of the kind of the main ones is like, yeah, it's a huge collection of bash scripts and um Bash is kind of a really terrible programming language and environments, and that kind of contributes to the bugs. And there's also platform-specific issues where certain platforms will change things, um, mm-hmm. and it has to be cognizant of all of this. And then there's also issues with how it organizes Rubies. Um, like, if, for instance, you basically assumes that it should be installed into your home directory. You can install it system-wide, but... The installation of the software is coupled to the location where it actually installs the rubies. And that really kind of annoyed me because I really kind of wanted all my rubies out of my home directory. I wanted my own software installed globally so other users on my system, maybe like I have some automated script that ran under like a, a you know dummy user account for safety reasons. I wanted it to have access to it. And I want to have rubies installed in some global location and then also have rubies installed in some like you know my home directory mm-hmm. or you know i have other partitions where i usually just like a dump code where i want to like check out the latest version of rubinius and so i'll pull that down some other directory and build it build it there and that really wasn't possible with rvm uh it will be possible with rvm2 with the ability to mount arbitrary installation paths where ruby is installed maybe you threw it in the opt directory or somewhere else so that was kind of one of the things, and then eventually, I like they just got so many bugs where I kind of like went back to using System Ruby because it was just really useful, and most of my work involved uh, just developing against like you know 2.0, right? And then using Travis CI to test all the other versions, right? But then um, I got like started a contract, and I was like, oh crap, I'm going to really need to get a working environment here that I can just, you know, use any sort of um, version. So I kind of got thinking about it. And it's like, you know, usually when I start projects, there's always this period of like deep thought and kind of research. So I was kind of like, do I really want to spend the time (laughs) developing like a Ruby switcher? I mean, there's RVM, it's giant. Am I going to like fall down the same path that, um, you know, kind of like the, the, the developers of RVM have like a, I believe uh, Wayne kind of got burnt out with dealing with all the issues, and Michael Pappas is, uh, or Mikel Pappas is uh, doing a really good job of maintaining it, but still like really stressful. So I was like, I went around and kind of like researched how RVM um, basically like changed, manipulated the path, and then I also got, uh, I looked at R- RBMV because I started like, okay, well, let's let's look at the alternatives before I jump into like starting a huge project right mm-hmm. before a contract job where I'm gonna have to be like heads down, dedicated. And so there's like lots of various other Ruby switchers out there. And um, RBM is pretty much the only shims-based Ruby switcher. Mm -hmm. And so there's kind of like issues when, uh, because I tried it when it was still kind of pretty new and fresh. And so it was kind of confused with how the shims worked. And they had like different levels of setting which desired Ruby do you want like uh, you had like the was it shell local system and global or something like that uh, yeah 
And then the, also, I I felt like it it copied a lot of features, not copied, but you know, it re-implemented a lot of RVM-ish features. So I kind of felt like it wasn't really thinking outside the box. It wasn't like unthinking. It was still kind of following in the shadow or the footsteps of kind of like how all of us Rubyists have sort of like grew grew up expecting the environment to work and the tools and you know it like even has a sub command feature which is like a very rvm ish thing in my opinion mm -hmm. and instead of having multiple separate utilities and scripts that work together in conjunction uh has this huge like sub command thing um but yeah there's also lots of other weird ruby switchers it turns out that is like kind of looking around by the way i define ruby switcher as something that only switches the ruby version uh, that seems handle... to be the the thing that you say most is like this is just a switcher. It doesn't install like RVM does. Right. It's right. one job and one job only, which I guess falls back on your Linux Unix background too of of you know one job really well. Right, and there's lots of other basically implement implementations of this, and I found that like I kind of went through and kind of rated them or scored them on like uh, features and it's uh, one of the kind of the probably the most well-developed ones was uh, rbfoo uh, by hmans that's his uh, github handle and so i tried that i was like okay this might be it uh, what i'm looking for and because they just need something really minimal that just manipulates path and you know sets some couple environment variables you know it's, it, it shouldn't be this hard and so i looked at it and like some of the things were nice um but one of the things that kind of annoyed me with it was kind of the syntax. So when you actually type the version, it, for some reason, he like began the versions with an at sign. And then there was also kind of the whole coupling where it expected the rubies to be in your home directory. And sure, you could probably sim link them out, but I really want to have like a configurable list where I just give arbitrary paths. Right. And then also I noticed a lot of these Ruby switchers would always set, well, they would hard code the gem path and gem, uh, gem home which are kind of the locations where it should look up the Ruby gems. And one of the things that kind of annoyed me is the, so when you install, since was it Ruby one nine Ruby gems has been uh, shipped with Ruby. Mm -hmm. So it actually Ruby gems has its own main gem directory inside Ruby. And actually now uh, Ruby comes with some uh, pre-installed gems like uh, big decimal. Um, what was it? IO console. Uh, some other ones I can't remember off the top of my head. But anyways, so it's really important that, first of all, you're not supposed to assume that the gem directory of that's in the main Ruby install is always in that location. Because Rubinius actually has its own also gem directory that they sh that's, you know, kind of in w when you install Rubinius, it also installs its own gem directory. And it's in, not in the same location, which mm -hmm. is kind of a little annoyance. But um, also the fact that the uh, you need the actual API version of the Ruby. So, for instance, uh, this is not the actual version of the Ruby, but the actual kind of overarching API version, like you know, um, all the one eight series. It was just one eight, but since uh, MRI one nine zero was kind of a botched release that had like some showstopper bugs in it, they actually bumped the API version to one nine one. So that's kind of another kind of like hiccup you have to detect. And then also um, the gem directory might not be writable. Um, people assume it's going to be writable yeah. because the Ruby install is in your home directory and you probably have a writable access to that. And I kind of felt that that was kind of violating the whole Unix pr principle mm -hmm. of uh, keeping software separate from the user so you don't actually delete it or, you know, download some weird virus and, you know, embeds itself in the software. You have writable permission separation where you you would separate the gems you installed as a user versus the gems you installed as roots, which is something also I, I, I you know uh, copied from how Fedora sets theirs up. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, Debian also has updated, has done something similar. And I also want to basically be able to switch between rubies from arbitrary locations. And it would just automatically detect the gem directory and calculate it all out. The other thing uh, that also annoyed me about using RVM was the fact that they made gem directories specific to each patch level, which was really annoying when you upgrade because you have to upgrade yeah. all your gems yeah. and like it's only a patch level, guys. It's not like a <laughs> big feature feature breaking version release. Um, so that's kind of like that. I put all that together. I think I spent about a week, week and a half kind of like doing all this research and 
kind of like figuring out the features and how to go about doing them and uh, kind of wrote up my first initial version. And So, uh, so you spent the, the couple of weeks trying to figure out the features and then the feature you landed on, uh, the feature set you landed on is like very, very small. It, it's interesting. And just to clarify, like we've had kind of the longer this show goes on, like in terms of the change log as a whole, not this particular show, uh, we've obviously had like predecessors and then like current, right. the new hot, and then, you know, the, yeah. w- uh, the future people will inevitably come. But just to, just to make sure that nobody here uh, thinks this way, like we're not here to disparage against any of the previous ones because oh, what no. they do is they, they set up a path and, and like a, you know, you can learn lessons and CH Ruby has, and Postmodern has benefited greatly from the things that the, the ones before him have done. And so, yeah, go ahead. Uh, also, I was going to point out that uh, uh, Mikhail Pappas, uh, the current maintainer of RVM1 and also who's working on RVM2, basically I kind of showed it to him. And this was like the first version of CHRuby, which didn't even support auto switching. And he was like, oh, great, another Ruby switcher. <laughs> you know, oh, you're going to just, you know, disparage RVM and, you know, poo-poo on it. And like, I was like, no, 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 it's just completely different scale down. It only does this one thing. It's not supposed to try. It's not trying to compete with RVM or even RBM. As far as I can right. tell, too, when Michael was on the show recently, too, he was saying that RVM 2.0 was going to expand not only into Ruby but also Python and be and yes. go beyond. So I mean, I think he had like this much yeah, larger ta- scope to go towards. Yeah, he's talking about basically um, also integrating with the package manager, and so it's very similar to certain things like um, oh. Uh, Red Hat has this thing called, was it software collection layers or something like that? But basically he wants uh, an environment manager, literally, and yeah. something that can yeah. install MySQL and dump a really nice auto, you know, basic configuration so you can, you know, start using it out of the box. Um, yeah, but and also he's helped me a lot with a lot of the bash issues and sort of bouncing ideas off him of like, well, how did RVM handle this mm-hmm. weird, obscure That's problem? That's awesome, honestly. I mean, yeah. Mike was a good guy. I know he took over for Wayne when, when things kind of got harder for him. And, and we've had uh, several people on the show come in and talk about um, burnout. I can't recall his name. Andrew helped me out, but he was um, on just like four or five shows back. Names gap me right now. I'm going to look at our show list. But I think to Andrew's point was to say that, you know, we're not here to bash any yeah. predecessors. We're here to – this is open source. Things change. Software is the mm-hmm. most complex, volatile market ever. So, I mean, obviously that's the yeah. case. We love Mike. We love RVM. And, but we we lift up everybody to, to kind of get their word out and what they're doing and why it's important and why Ruby should care. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Let's pause this show for just a minute and give a shout-out to our sponsor, CodeShip. They're also a partner of ours, so – Super excited to be working with CodeShip. They're a hosted continuous deployment service that just works. You can easily set up continuous integration for your application today in just a few steps and automatically deploy when all your tests pass. CodeShip has great support for lots of languages, test frameworks, as well as notification services. They easily integrate with GitHub or Bitbucket and can deploy to cloud services like Heroku, AWS, Nojitsu, Google App Engine, or even your own servers. Get started today with their free plan. Setup only takes three minutes. Head to CodeShip.io and also check out their blog, blog.CodeShip.io. And one more thing to mention for our members, you can save between $294 and $2,994 on your first year with CodeShip. So make sure you take advantage of that. Head to thechangeall.com slash benefits to learn more. Once again, CodeShip.io. Try it today. So to kind of move forward, the when I first found CH Ruby, which was I don't you know maybe ten months ago, a year ago, fifteen, I don't know, so somewhere in the past, uh, the way that everyone was using it was uh, basically using Ruby Build, which was built by Sam Stevenson and others. Um, I think originally just was supposed to be purely for RBM, and then they decided to like make it easier to use as a standalone thing. And so CHRuby was just a switcher, and a lot of people were using Ruby build to actually install Rubies. Um, and 
just recently, I you know went back and started evaluating these things again, and I saw that now there's Ruby install, um, which essentially does the same thing as Ruby build. It actually allows you to install Rubies. So why? So I obviously we see why you you created CH Ruby and you know looking at all the other ones. What about that? Why why did you create Ruby uh-huh. install? So initially, I also used Ruby Build because you know it's it was a nice decoupled tool, and I could just use it for its one specific purpose. But there's lots of things about it that kind of got under my skin, and so I started this whole process of kind of like evaluating it, and evaluating how RVM also handles uh, compiling, and installing, and of course they go into way more detail of handling weird, obscure uh, platform specific issues. But um, so what the way Ruby build works is it has basically definitions for every single version. So literally you can you can you have to actually specify the fully qualified version. And that was kind of one annoyance because literally I just I when I install, uh, you know, some version, I really don't care. Just give me the most recent one nine three that you know of um, or, you know, literally copy and paste the version from. Uh, the the news the news announcement on Ruby Lang when they release a new version they're gonna, it's going to be there so just copy and paste it in the command line. But then as I kind of like dug into it more, um, that was kind of a minor nuisance. But um, I dug into it a lot more. I found that it does lots of really weird things with trying to detect um, kind of when libraries are available, and it also can download. Um, its own versions of OpenSSL and compiles those and then links Ruby against that. And that kind of like, that worried me because I automatically knew that eventually there's going to be a vulnerability in these libraries and there's Uh-oh. not going to be an easy way <laughs> to to update them. You can't just go like, oh, update the library. Like it's it's compiled, installed into its own directory and literally you have to reinstall the Rubies to, ca- to force the newer version to get downloaded and then the Ruby compiled against the newer version. So I was kind of like, well, obviously that's kind of a that should be another feature. Is just to use the package manager uh, because every system the packages are there available. You can compile against them, and they dy- the Ruby dynamically links against them. And so when there's a vulnerability, you just update the package. You're good to go. And also distributions are really good about backporting security fixes, and so you can update and not worry about getting weird API breakage. Um, you literally just get that one fix. So that was kind of another thing that inspired me, and and uh, I, I really just want something that would work on as many systems against many package managers as possible. Mm-hmm. And of course, it's a lot easier because uh, CHRuby has to work in both Bash and ZSH, whereas Ruby install was a utility, and so I could just write against Bash three and uh, do that. Yeah, and so and I basically kind of took a very um, declarative uh, design to it where literally you have like individual files, build files for each major implementation and they define the configuration step, the compile step, and the install step. And then kind of like any sort of specific uh, package manager configuration, like you have to do some weird things with Homebrew because its packages aren't in like a a place where a lot of the... um, the auto conf- the auto conf scripts of MRI can find them, so you have to literally hint at it, which is something I I, I learned from uh, RVM where there's an option called was it with opter, mm-hmm. and you have to pass that in specifically for uh, homebrew, and and Mac ports also because Mac ports right. installs in that's opt. still around. Um, yeah, yeah, actually, and I got a recently got a uh, a bug report from a user who was attempting to use Fink, which is <laughs> like super yeah. old. Yeah, and like back in the day, actually, I had was it the uh, the last generation iBook, and it's, I ran OS X for a while, and then uh, back when it was like PowerPC, and I went back to uh, running like Linux on it. So I knew about Think, and I was like, "Whoa, that's still what? People use that still?" But yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, um, just glancing at the glancing at the project homepage, they are still getting regular releases, which is pretty cool to see it lasting yeah. this long. Yeah. That's cool. So I guess that's a, you kind of hit on, uh, you had a, a, not a feature request, but a bug report. And, and uh, you do the CH Ruby and Ruby install, they do such small things. So how often, like CH Ruby is 90 lines of code, right? So maintaining mm-hmm. this w- seemingly would be much easier than maintaining RVM. Uh, so how much of your time do you have to dedicate to actually maintaining CH Ruby? 
Um, it's pretty much feature complete at this point. Uh, basically, I'm sort of waiting. It's kind of one of the first projects where I've been really skeptical about feature requests. Uh, normally, a lot of my projects, I'm like always trying to please whoever is submitting the issue and you know thinking up crazy new features to add. But this is the first one where I actually really constrained myself, and that was caused primarily because of the li the line uh, line count uh, limitation. Because I want to keep it the core of it in a hundred lines. And, um, of course, there's other additional things like the, the auto-switching, but that's in a separate, separate file, file that you yeah. can choose not to load because a lot of, um, in a previous job, uh, there's I worked with this uh, system administrator who just, like, cringed at the idea of having some sort of crazy bash script that, you know, auto-detects and mm -hmm. switches rubies when you see the into directories. And so, um, but, yeah, so that really has kind of constrained me and that's going to be kind of really interesting where I actually really critically look at features and whether they can be uh, implemented by like third party tools or if they have to be integrated right. or do we even really need them? Because a lot of the feature requests were uh, basically things that people were used to coming from RVM. And I kind of think like, well, do we really need this? Like, or is this just something we're really kind of familiar with and we miss? Did I miss why really, you said yeah. that there's a constraint? Why the underlying constraint? So basically, I wanted to keep it as small as possible. I didn't want to like go out of control and you know develop a you know a, a sub command system or any of these other things that the bigger kind of Ruby switchers managers have. And so I kind of like I was kind of like looked down on the whole idea of like putting line constraints, line count constraints on projects as kind of like it's kind of like a hat trick, you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of like Vim golf, yeah. yeah. but really it does, it does help you. It forces you, it like, it sets a real kind of like, um, like risk points or danger point where it's like, you cannot pass this line. It's this invisible barrier. And once you and do, you're in really, some danger. Right. And, um, yeah. And so that, that's, that's kind of helped me, um, dealing with maintenance uh there was a period when i first rolled out the auto switching that i did have to deal with tons of bugs and weird shell issues and so i spent a lot of time asking stupid questions in the bass irc channel and getting really kind of like burnt out uh, disgruntled replies <laughs> and um stop asking yeah, yeah i know it's like rtfm dude but um <laughs> yeah so that that kind of did take up some time but since it was so small, a lot of the changes just required thinking really carefully about kind of the trade-offs. That's another thing about shell scripting is it seems simple on, on its face, but every single command, every sort of behavior has like a dozen or so edge cases you have to be mm -hmm. cognizant of. And then there's also implementation differences between the shells uh, based on like which, how they evolved because like bash came from ash um, and there's also Dash, which is yeah. the bin SH on Debian systems, which is like super minimal. It has barely anything. Like most Bash code will not run on it. Mm -hmm. um, and then ZHA, ZSH actually came from KSH, and they have their own weird, bizarre features um, that many people probably don't know about. For instance, arrays in ZSH are indexed starting at one, not zero. <laughs> so I can't really what? rely on that. Yeah, yeah I know. It, they, they thought it was a really cool feature. That's apparently. stupid. Sorry. Yeah, I, I know. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the kind of when you get into that, the more you have to like sit there and actually test and ponder. And that's actually the other thing is I was really super aggressive about unit testing shell scripts. And it always seems like when you when new languages uh, come about that don't have like test suites or people kind of like ha misinterpret the language or like, I don't know. They think it's really simple. They always like say, "Oh, we don't need to test. Why would you test that? You just just run it from the, the command line. It's, yeah. uh, you don't need unit tests here." <laughs> and people said this for like JavaScripts when it was first starting out, when like you know most code was just like three functions. And then they also said it about Bash script. But then once the testing tools get developed and people get you know used to them, it really does help. And that helped uh, kill a lot of bugs. And it actually. It, it, it was really cool because a lot of the other people who de uh, developed their own Ruby switchers uh, came in and started like uh, suggesting features and you know how to solve various implement the auto switching. So we actually were discussing this in issues by sending submitting pull requests or example unit tests. So we really were just like speaking mm -hmm. using the test as the implementation, and so that was really cool to see uh, instead of like you know getting these long winded uh, discussions and issues and. We could just be like, here's the code. 
Yeah. And I can imagine that like looking through pull requests, you know, kind of as an aside here, looking through pull requests and stuff for shell can kind of be kind of a disaster, right? Cause somebody like submits all this code, like, yeah, you have to understand it. And like, yeah, everyone has their own weird styles. Um, yeah. There is, although, um, shell scripting does, it's probably even more style obsessed than Ruby is. Uh, uh there's this one user who a uh, contributor came in and basically just like, Submit the, submitted this giant pull request that broke all the tests, and he's basically <laughs> trying to rewrite it from scratch. And like, it's like, whoa, slow down. Let's take this one step at a time. <laughs> and basically, kind of like he got me to um, fix all the style issues. And wow. like, for instance, there's like very hardcore. These style issues are not just like you're supposed to do it because it looks nice, but there's actually safety reasons behind it. Hmm. For instance, most people, uh, when they start doing shell script, they always see uppercase uh, variables. So they just assume all variables are uppercase. But all script local variables, all function local variables are supposed to be lowercase. So they don't overshadow the other global variables that are passed in as an as environment uppercase. variables, quote yeah. unquote. Um, yeah, so that's kind of like one of the major things we had to change. And yeah, it's other stuff that's crazy so awesome have you had any other projects that have gotten as popular in the open source community as these geez um I'm trying to think here maybe maybe bundler audits that's that's probably it um or actually there's another um, library i did where after Ruby 1.9 came out, Ruby Zip was kind of unmaintained for a really mm -hmm. long time, and it didn't work. And so I just got frustrated and forked it and, you know, tried to get it working in 1.9 and released kind of another gem. Mm -hmm. And apparently that got a lot of downloads because a lot of people were just like, I just need this library to freaking to work. To work, on. yeah. Well, the reason so, I ask yeah. is because, you know, you're, we were talking about, like, CTFs before the show and just, the, like, your attitude um, seems, you know, you, you go by an alias. And so it seems like privacy is a important thing to you right? I mean you're into security and all that so I wonder like was there any implications for you of like just getting popular like and, and, and getting like notoriety and getting pointed at for a lot of stuff well um I, I'm very like I've always been very anti-celebrity anti mm -hmm. kind of cult of personality um coming from like the security hacking world uh it's it's a huge problem um like there's like you there's like uh, you go through cycles where like someone will rise to fame and they'll be speaking at every conference and usually uh, often recycling their you know previous talk mm -hmm. and um and kind of that co uh, that community has developed this huge kind of like immune response to that where if you're not putting out um actual useful information new information new research um they quickly kind of like forget about you and sort mm -hmm. of just like whatever like if you're just sort of being a thought leader, uh, you're not really as valued as much as someone who's actually doing like really useful work. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I guess um, I'm very cognizant about not doing not doing that. And one of the things I make sure to do is always give credits to the contributors. And I also got a shout out for um, uh, the user Havenwood on GitHub has been a huge help in maintaining yeah. uh, CHRuby. He's helped with uh, always submitting. Um, the homebrew uh, updated homebrew recipes to homebrew and testing things on OSX because I don't have an OSX system currently. So, and it's like huge help. So it's just not me being all like I'm not super genius here <laughs> developing it like in a vacuum. Uh, no, yeah, I, actually, that's one thing that that kind of struck me as surprising is that CHRuby has 30 contributors on GitHub. Um, so obviously there's a number of contributors that actually probably, well, not obviously, but I would assume there's a number of them that have not actually, uh, you know, contributed to the shell scripts themselves, but to other things mm -hmm. around them. But, but it's still, I mean, it, like it's 90 lines of code in the shell script and you have 30 contributors. It's like, that's a pretty big ratio. And I think that's neat. I think that's cool to see so many people like pitch in and help on different angles. And you, know, you said like with the homebrew and you probably have people that have just updated the readme, but people care about this and what you're doing. And yeah. that seems pretty cool. And also, I think what uh, came out of it was I wrote a generic make file because I was kind of annoyed of how all these pro uh, shell script projects, either they had this really simple install.sh file or they like, you know, you curl down and install script. Mm -hmm. and I just really wanted a simple make file that just installed, worked on BSD and Linux, and like, because there's issues with the version of make on BSD and Linux, uh, the gene you make versus the BSD make. 
And so a lot of those, like, con- there's like, I guess you had a lot of casual contributors and they fix kind of the minor things. And I think that's really also important in open source too. Um, if you see a minor bug, you should probably at least report it or fix it. Um, cause every little fix counts. It does add up. Mm-hmm. And even if it's like typos in the readme or, you know, uh, this is a uh, jumping forward, but just on the, <laughs> I hate to put a light on me cause I don't like to do that whatsoever, but you know, you talk about little fixes. They had a little fix in your public uh, Ronin, um, yeah. which was like, because I was doing some <laughs> research for the call, and I was like, oh, this link is off. But the coolest thing about GitHub is it let me easily click edit, fix the link right. for you, and submit a pull request, you know, in a couple clicks. And, you know, Steve Kladnick had a, an awesome post on the change log, I think about a year and a half back, that still gets tons and tons of reads. We'll link out to in the show notes if you're listening to this, but... You know, like you had said, all those little fixes, 30 contributors, they may not have done the heavy lifting, but they're they're right. keeping a line on the edges, you know, that, that you forget well, or you miss. It's sort of the uh, long tail, yeah. long tail principle, mm-hmm. you know, where it's the casual contributors do actually add up over time. And, and it's also kind of minor things do actually turn away a lot of potential users. And so it's kind of when you do release code, you have to be kind of OCD about that. Um, if, if they see a typo in the readme, they're probably going to like, they're going to be biased automatically against the against the project. Um, but yeah, the funny thing about that typo was uh, when GitHub changed to all the user pages to like GitHub IO, um, I have this Git alias, Git said, so I can actually do mass find replaces. And I end up bro- breaking the URL on every single page. And so <laughs> I had to undo that. Yeah, I'm sure that was fun to fix. So it's actually go really easy using get set, but well, yeah, still, yeah, yeah. it was a noise. You know, I, double l- I literally changed two characters, which was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so going then to Ronin, I think Ronin, uh, looking through all the projects that were listed, I think Ronin was the probably the first one. Uh, well, not the first one, but one of the bigger ones that I've heard about um, from you. So why don't you talk a little bit about Ronin and what it is and what's the purpose? Oh, yeah. So uh, back in the day, I was working in a computer security research group. Uh, we had this project. Um, well, I mean, I was like thinking like, well, uh, you know, Ruby is a really great language for doing DSLs. Uh, we, there's already like, you know, you could think of Rails as kind of a DSL framework uh, for doing web development because they kind of wrap everything up in nice helper methods. And so it like it, high, it abstracts away a lot of the complexities. Like I'm talking like Rails 2, mm-hmm. old school. Um no, it's really complex these days. But uh, so I kind of thought like, well, hey, this Ruby language might be pretty useful because uh, like you know, I was looking at the documentation, for instance, they have like a Telnet module mm-hmm. and it's really nice. We can use the blocks to automatically set up the Telnet session, handle it and then tear it down. So I was like, wow, this can actually be pretty useful for writing exploits because exploits really aren't that complex code wise. And you could also then write a lot of the helper methods and make everything basically one line, uh, basically doable in one line of code where you just string together the helper methods. And so that was kind of my, um, my project with Ronin was to create an environment uh, with kind of like an active support type library called Ronin support that provided all the helper methods, which I call convenience methods uh, for various things that like security research need to do like all the time. And then provide kind of a main kind of console environments and then a system for installing repositories of other people's code. Um, Cause you know, back, back within people are still using Ruby gems of Ruby to mm-hmm. distribute. So it's a lot easier um, for your kind of average security researcher who isn't really like a top level developer They're That's not what they're after. They're like trying to do research and break things and find cool vulnerabilities. And so, it was kind of a lot easier it's in my mind. It's like basically just have a repository system that you can give a URL and it'll pull down some SVN or a Git or whatever um, directory of their code and uh, pull it all together. But yeah, it was kind of one of my big, one of my first big projects and that spawned a lot of different other libraries and gems. And then because like a lot of code got pulled out of it as it kind of matured. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of useful code kind of got split out of that. So. And I was kind of following the uh, the model that Data Mapper uh, followed. That basically they split everything up into uh, smaller amounts, smaller libraries over time. Mm-hmm. And so I was kind of like doing that. But um, yeah, so I kind of got caught up in work, and so I like kind of like put Roan more to the to the side. But now I'm sort of like 
thinking about how things have changed and definitely want to get back on the project and simplify some various things. So you do plan to get back into Ronin? That's Oh, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. There's, there's it, a lot of unfinished code in there. Gotcha. So this is an interesting... I, I think this is interesting to me because you were kind of doing security research with Ruby four years ago, and the amount that Ruby has changed in the last mm-hmm. four years or, you know, in the last X years... Uh, I mean, you've had to keep up with a lot of change. So what has the process been like maintaining? I think this might be one of the oldest uh, actual, like, uh, projects that is still maintained that we've actually had on the show. What's that been like? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, there's those periods of rapid growth in the Ruby community where we had things like, uh, you know, we switched uh, we switched to Jeweler, and then we switched off Jeweler, and then we had Bundler, and then we kind of, like, there's all these kind of evolution of tools. And so it was kind of really difficult to keep up. And we, you know, we went, we transitioned from Ruby forge to Ruby gems. Uh, then the RVM came along. So it was kind of difficult to keep up all these tools and actually found myself kind of like gradually moving away from the tools or not just like, it seemed like when any of these tools came out, we, everyone just sort of like, we must use this everywhere possible all the time, irregardless. And I kind of found myself that it's really not that necessary. For instance, if your library has like one or two dependencies and they're probably installed anyways, like the JSON gem or a rake, mm-hmm. you probably don't need, you don't need bundler. And um, so, yeah, and like, and also kind of developing these tools, they, I mean, these libraries, they were kind of my like personal playground. And so I did kind of like develop tools based out of that because I got tired of like having to always edit the readme that was generated by Jeweler or, or by Ho or by um, Bundler. I just wanted like projects set up automatically with like RSpec and all that stuff. And so I kind of wrote like a uh, OR, which is like a, a project skeletoning tool. And so yeah, it has been a bumpy road and it's especially annoying when there's like issues with Ruby upstream, mm-hmm. um, like kind of the major, like whatever, like open SSL would break things or, um, but at the same time, it has been nice where we did develop tools to deal with that. Where, I, for instance, like a long time, I just always recommend people to install RVM first, and then, you know, before installing Ronin, and like install the latest version. But at the same time, I kind of felt like you know we were moving a little too quickly, and maybe it would have been a little better to sit back and kind of like reevaluate what what our actual needs are. Because like for instance, the same thing with how um, RBM kind of um, inherits a lot of the features and like uh, ways of doing things from RVM. You kind of also saw that in Bundler about how Bundler basically also developed its own little static project generation tool, and which like was basically constantly being changed and updated, and because it's really hard to get get right first, because um, everyone has like little nitpicky uh, changes to like mm-hmm. how they want projects generated. And, um, or it also has like, you know, it embeds their own release tasks, which are kind of like crummy. They don't, they don't use proper rake file tasks. And so it will like always rebuild your gem irregardlessly of even if no files have changed. So I kind of felt like, uh, you know, maybe a little better to actually like slow down and kind of like take stock of things. Uh, so I'm just constantly racing around trying to release versions all the time. Yeah. So one thing I wanted to to kind of bring up the we forgot to talk about this before actually um, with CH gems and and sorry to kind of do a huge context switch here uh, yeah. we actually didn't talk about CH gems can you just give me a just uh, kind of introduce what CH gems is real quick and I have a question about it for you so CH gems was sort of my attempt to kind of rethink gem sets because one of the kind of assumptions that go along with gem sets is they're always named. And they always are stored in your .gem directory, wherever that is. And I kind of want, and then also they had to be implicitly uh, like auto switched. So, which kind of did make sense because the majority of the time, like you would have this like RVM gem set file, and it would have a name in it, and it would use that gem set when you CD'd into the directory. It would then activate the gem set, and I kind of thought that this was like first of all like. Uh, I didn't feel too comfortable with having like this automatic feature and I didn't really agree if always having the gem sets in, in your home directory is like, why not just put the gem set in the actual project directory mm-hmm. in the same way that, uh, you know, you can do uh, a bundler install and 
st- uh, put everything in vendor gems. Mm-hmm. And then I kind of decided, well, let's take a different approach because there's like apparently also a lot of people wrote their own kind of gem set replacement scripts. There's like, oh, my gems. There's, oh, is it Rev? That's mm-hmm. one version. And uh, also, was it GS, Gem Switcher? And I basically just wanted to make something that instead of you actually having to like enter into a gem set and then leave, because I always would find myself when using RVM gem sets, forgetting that I was still in that gem set and being like, oh, hey, that's that's why half of my gems are missing. Yeah. Then you install so, a bunch of gems to the wrong gem set and get all pissed right. off when you have to clean it up. Right. And like, or just like you forget <laughs> exactly. about it. You've made it for a project that like, you know, you wanted to make a couple line fixes to this like huge project that had zillions of dependencies. And so you want to like isolate it, some gem, gem set. And then you forget about it and like, you know, remember it when you're like going around cleaning up your home directory, wondering mm-hmm. why you you don't have any space left. <laughs> um, yeah. So I kind of like took the approach of uh, CH root where you can uh, basically explicitly enter into a project and then that starts a or like a, a system image and then it starts a subshell within that system directory and it makes that the current root. And it's kind of nice because you can basically exit out of the shell and you go back to your previous uh, environments, Mm -hmm. your previous system. So I kind of felt that that was a really good model. Um, Basically explicitly go into a project and then leave. Um, But yeah, there's actually some problems that arose with that. And um, because the way that CHRuby auto-switching was expected to work, uh, people who use Tmux, for instance, Mm -hmm. when they opened a uh, split pane or, or split terminal, it didn't properly initialize or inherit the um, the shell environments from the other terminal, and so basically a lot of chruby, I mean, uh, uh, Tmux users um, requested that chruby always auto uh, set the Ruby version on on new subshells. So uh, so I had to make that change, and that kind of ended up uh, conflicting with chgems because chgems uh, spawns a subshell. And so there's kind of this weird kind of like mm-hmm. uh, race condition where um, CHGEM basically s- sets the gem home and gem path and then passes that to the uh, subshell uh, process. And then when the sub- subshell initializes, uh, basically then CHRuby loads and then it resets the gem home and gem path. And so it's like it's, uh, it's a dicey kind of... Uh, way to deal with it without coupling the tool the two uh tools together where right i didn't want to like have some sort of like flag of like you know do not reload ch ruby you know <laughs> that would feel like a little too much coupling even though it, if even though if it was just one variable but like yeah yeah let's pause the show for just a minute and give a shout out to our sponsors new relic if you've got a web or mobile application you need to know about new relic it's your new best friend, basically. It's your easy-to-use analytics dashboard that basically gives you powerful code-level visibility into the real-time performance of your application. So this means that you can spot bugs, see bottlenecks, and fix problems fast, hopefully before they even affect your users. And thanks to New Relic, you no longer have to ship your app to production and then helplessly wait around, hoping for the best until negative app reviews and tweets start to roll in. Uh, New Relic empowers you to to see what's going on and what's, what is working and what isn't working all in real time. And the way it works is really straightforward. They give you a lightweight agent that you unpackage into your production level apps. That agent sits around quietly and securely in the background, kind of gathering real time metrics across geographies, devices, platforms, all the way down to the end user level, and then displays all that data in real-time graphs so coders can have the visibility they need into the performance of their web applications and make everything awesome. So go and check out New Relic today by visiting newrelic.com slash thechangelog to learn more and use the offer code thechangelog and take advantage of this special 30-day extended free pro trial available exclusively to our listeners. newrelic.com slash thechangelog. So it surprised me. I don't know. Like, I don't, and I'm not really even necessarily sure why it surprised me, but it, it, it surprised me that CHGEMS even exists in the first place. Yeah. Um, it would be kind of nice if uh, either this functionality is kind of like baked into RubyGems itself, or uh, which it actually you can do. I mean, literally just set gem home to mm-hmm. some path, and there you go. Uh, just it's also the making sure that. Um, 
the bin directory of the gemdir is uh, you know takes precedence in the on the path. So mm-hmm. any sort of executable in there, you can just run and it'll go to that one. And uh, yeah, and like that's another thing. Also, kind of wish that uh, Bundler would kind of invest time into doing is provide some sort of shell script you can load that will automatically uh, kind of like detect the bin stubs and put those in the path or use or set up aliases or something. Um, Just so you wouldn't have to bundle exec every time. Yeah, or install or clutter your bin directory with bin stubs and like which can actually clobber existing files in there, mm-hmm. which is kind of annoying. Super uh, annoying. Bug. Yeah. And yeah, so that was kind of like my kind of like trying to answer that. But of course, like it is kind of a difficult problem. So is there a definitive blog post or write up that kind of prescribes how to use uh, CH Ruby, Ruby install and CH gems just for I mean, we got a lot of new listeners to the show that are just getting started. And we have a lot of very seasoned developers also using it. So we kind of have both chasms. Um, and I'm not sure if I've ever seen a, a full write-up of like, here's why you, and I know you're kind of on the show to talk about it a little bit, but here's why I did it. Here's, you know, why you should use it. And here's the implications of using it. These, you know, these several tools together. Is there a write-up that's just like clear as day? So there's actually lots of write-ups. Um, and I kind of let users write their own. Uh, this is kind of the first, usually, um, previous projects. I'd always kind of like naively, uh, Kind of put together this project and you know think like boy people are gonna love this and then I post <laughs> it to Reddit and then it just gets eviscerated. Yeah, oops. <laughs> yeah, and it's basically kind of like that whole. Uh, I feel like some some of the some of the criticism is valid, but I think a lot of people um, they like they kind of use that as a way to like pump themselves up of like kind of criticizing other projects. Mm-hmm. And that initial criticism can actually hinder the project and hold you back, and so. I literally just did word of mouth marketing kind of, I just recommended it like, Hey, here's this thing, check it out. You know, you, you make your, make your own uh, decision on it. So, uh, users have actually wrote up a lot of different blog posts about, uh, their experiences. Um, so literally you could just Google for like CH Ruby and you'll find a dozen or so blog, uh, blog posts and a couple actually in Japanese and Spanish, which is kind of cool. Um, sort of crossing that language barrier. And yeah, just kind of give the basic rundown of like, here's how I set it up. Here's you know, here's how you switch rubies. Here's how you install them, and here's kind of the caveats. And like, yeah, because I know one thing that I've always gotten held up on was always having coming from you know RVM to CH Ruby. I you know kind of depended on gem sets, and I've um, I've you know with Bundler and the way it handles things, I've kind of gotten rid of gem sets. I don't use it anymore. Obviously, I don't use ch gems yet and i haven't really had a need for it but i i find myself um only here and there having conflicts um and is that in maybe maybe i don't do enough with ruby to understand why someone would want to obviously isolate their their gem into a their gem you know gems for a project into a gem set but most often the reason you know clearly is for you know just the fact that you don't have any any bumps, there's clear isolation from other projects. Yeah, and also you're using environment variables to achieve this, and so you don't have a lot of the magic, quote unquote, that uh, Bundler does to ensure that it isolates all the dependencies. Right. And but I mean, there you shouldn't you should be able to like get away with just uh, migrating gem set projects to using uh, Bundler and uh, kind of like sharing gems that way. Uh, of course, you can also just directly edit the path and gem home and gem path environment variables and set your gem set that that way. And you just have to then ensure that every time that uh, project is ran, it's ran in a shell that loads up the configuration. And um, yeah, so yeah. Actually, I've been thinking about like uh, there's this tool that someone wrote uh, called Rev, which allows you to kind of like add, you know, set and uh, reset gem sets. I thought it'd be kind of interesting if someone actually wrote a tool that basically just pushed and popped uh, directories onto GemPath and then uh, set Gem Home accordingly, and that would allow you to actually like more fine grained control of the Gem Gem directory, kind of like search uh, search variable, mm-hmm. The, mm-hmm. the order in which it you know checks all the directories for the, for all your gems. And so I kind of felt like you know that'd be kind of interesting uh, way to do it, but really, I mean. It seems like there's a lot of confusion about how gem sets should work, ideally, and 
a lot of people are trying to kind of like reinvent them and explore different areas. And so it's not kind of really a solved problem yet. In yeah. My mind. Does that answer it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's I mean, like you said, it's a tough problem to solve anyways. And I don't think there's really a one way to do it, but I, you know, I now don't even depend at all on obviously gem sets, but I kind of miss them because I have had some conflicts. So then I end up uh, doing something that Andrew kind of mentioned earlier, which is like obliterate all my gems, which I have just a, um, I am happy to be a, a ZSH user. So I just type uh, FO and up a couple of times and I find the most recent for loop that I've written, you know, that basically <laughs> obliterates all my, you know, all my gems installed. And I just, because they're so easy to install and it probably even upticks the numbers of installs anyways, yeah. I just obliterate all my gems and just, you know, bundle install and I'm good to go in happy world. But, you know, so that's okay with me, but it still feels a little dirty. You know, it feels dirty to not have that segregation. Yeah, yeah, and plus, you know, the fact that the default behavior of Bundler is to install into the gem directory as opposed to, like, installing always into a vendor directory, and kind of, like, you get that trade-off where it's like, well, I can clutter up my gem directory, or, you know, I can blow it up the vendor directory. So, this might elongate the conversation yeah. a tiny bit further, but, you know, it's 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 uh, impossible to kind of um, miss the millions of dollars recently that NPM has gotten to become NPM Inc., and you've got other mm -hmm. package managers they come up to play like what is is ruby playing catch up is there something new out there that's being done by npm and bower and other package managers that simplify the way they're distributing and versioning for individual projects well um actually i haven't looked at npm yet i actually should do that but uh one of the things that is really interesting to me is haskell's package manager uh cabal and it apparently has its own concept of sandboxes. And so, and also what I really like about Cabal is the fact that y the specification for your project is literally um, uh, key value colon separated plain text. And so we don't have this like crazy, uh, uh, you know, pure Ruby gem spec, which is really kind of like gem spec was originally kind of designed for internal usage of, you know, describing the gem. And we turned it into this thing where we can actually, because uh, Ruby Gems, uh, it's faster for it to load actual Ruby code as opposed to deserializing it. So when you actually install a gem, it uh, unpacks the actual gem spec back into pure Ruby. And I guess this kind of gave people the idea of like, well, let's just put this gem spec in into the actual Git repository of our projects, and we'll have it list. The, you know, you use Git ls files. But I kind of feel that like violates dry uh, that we have this like random bit of code that we constantly regenerates and it has this like you know get commands embedded into it and i kind of like the fact that like cabal uh hides a lot of that from you and what i actually do for a lot of my projects is i put all the metadata into a gem spec yaml file and then my gem spec is basically just boilerplate code that loads that file and sets all the fields um and also like cabal i mean uh, cabal and uh, haskell's gh ghc compiler uh has a really really con like advanced dependency tracking system where it can actually recompile code that you know if, if it detects some change somewhere so really interesting yeah i mean you mentioned you haven't uh, looked into npm much but one of the ways it does um package installation is you can pass it a flag to say um you know save to local basically so it's dash dash save or you can add mm -hmm. a dash dash save dash dev onto it and it and it actually uh, will either go global if you don't do dash save. I think you might have to pass the flag dash G to it, uh, possibly. So let hmm. me correct me if I'm wrong. But but then it also just drops into your project, um, most often hidden if you're hiding it with your editor, you know, with your ID or just Sublime Text, whatever hmm. you use. But then it drops it all into no modules, and from there you have them locally with your project, and that way you kind of don't have this gem set need. You almost right, just right. have your project and you either save locally or you don't. You just either install globally or install locally and it just pulls the version that way. It's a, I mean, so far I've you know, kind of been dabbling in some JavaScript development and it's been coming from the Ruby world into that world. I've saw kind of both sides of the fence and it's, it's neat the way they handle it and no conflicts yet. So it's, yeah, I, I don't quite have the job you do of maintaining this project and the and the dependencies it has against it but eh, kind of neat the way they do it oh yeah totally um yeah i definitely feel like kind of the 
uh, challenges uh, that Ruby switchers have to deal with is kind of uh, dealing with the environment variables that you use to then manipulate um, how Ruby gems operates. Yeah. And sometimes it would kind of be nice if if it did automatically detect uh, gem dire dot gem directories, and that's just how it worked. But of course, there's like security issues with you know running into malicious gem gem directories and. Uh, yeah, you've got a security <laughs> background, so you're you're thinking not only how do you use it as a developer, but how do you securely use it as a developer? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You know, because you know we pull down tons of code every yeah. day off of trusted, GitHub and, you know, right? Yes, quote unquote trusted, and like it'd be very trivial for someone to have like um like for a lot of those tools that automatically load environment variables uh, when you cd into the directory, and you could totally convince someone to do that, and like you would have some sort of uh, way to you know uh, manipulate the path where you can actually redirect it and like you know so instead of typing ls and using system ls it all of a sudden you know using their weird yep. backdoor ls or their alias version yeah. you know. right so that's kind of a, yeah so not to uh hijack the conversation too much but we are kind of running up against our our time limit here so i want to uh go ahead and ask our our standard set of questions for you postmodern if if you're okay with that um yep. The, the first one is for a call to arms or a call to action for uh, the open source community on any any of the projects that we've talked about. Okay, so um, I actually have been thinking about writing a blog post about this, but it's probably better just to uh, put it into words here. Uh, so this is like super, super radical thing to say, but you do not need a Ruby manager or switcher in production if you only have one Ruby. <laughs> and this is just something that people, I don't, uh, not necessarily the word cargo cults, I think applies, but we just have gotten used to doing it, and then that's just how we do it. And it's baked into all these configuration and management uh, tools like Chef and Puppets, and you just don't. First of all, the package manager's Ruby is usually roughly up to date. Um, the latest version of Ubuntu available on Amazon, uh, it's, it's recently up to, I think it's 193 still, but they're, they're going to bump that to 2.0, and of course, there's like still GC issues with uh, MRI 2.1. And even if your system and the benefit of using the package manager is you can enable things like unattended uh, upgrades, where the package manager will automatically imply security updates and just have to restart your processes, and that's really nice. Uh, as opposed to actually then freaking out at you know 3 a.m. in the morning and you know doing like doing RVM get head and installing the latest version to deal with some sort of critical uh, uh, security vulnerability. And also, even if the package manager doesn't offer the most up-to-date package, you can roll your own packages with FPM. You can also install the Ruby into USR Local, and that's the purpose of USR Local and the whole Unix file system hierarchy, is that it's for all the software that you install that's not installed by the system. Mm -hmm. So like, USR is controlled by the package manager, the administrator controls USR, and on most systems, uh, USR local bin always comes before USR bin in the path, and so any software you install there overrides the system software. Mm -hmm. And like, I feel that a lot of people kind of like miss this, and I feel like setting up a you know production environment shouldn't be that difficult, and it, you just really need to like install a package or extract a tar of a precompiled Ruby, and like mm -hmm. it's not that difficult. So just add, yeah, I don't know. So just to, just to clarify, I believe this is the first time that the call to arms from our guest has been to not use their project <laughs> in production. Yeah, you don't. It's, it's just it adds so much so more true. complexity of making sure it works with all these system components. And it's really more the Ruby switcher is more optimized for developments mm -hmm. and, you know, testing things because, like, seriously, it. it it just makes it so much easier. <laughs> awesome. So the second question, if you weren't doing what you're doing now, what would you be doing? Oh, man. Um, so you mean like open source or work-wise? Or... Well, anything. Surfing or work-wise <laughs> or what, what would you do you with write? your free time? Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. Probably, uh, probably, uh, probably writing uh, like uh, various security exploitation tools. That's uh, it's kind of on my list of things to do. So, which technically I do sort of do for work. But yeah, there's a there's a back end to that that uh, question too, which is like maybe uh, an open source project out there that you've wanted to hack on, but you know you've got obviously a list of things you're doing, but you haven't had ch a chance to hack on it. What's you know what's uh, 
what's something you've seen out there that you wish you had time to hack on that you would, you don't and you would love to if you had a weekend? Oh man. Oh man. Okay. So there's actually a couple of projects that I feel that I really could use some like extra help and simplifying things and kind of like exercising out the really bad, ugly code that's kind of built up the technical debt. And one of the projects I've been really loving recently is Pedrino. Um, Mm -hmm. I feel it's a really nice layer on top and they, they've been doing more than just building on top of Sinatra. They have their own custom router and it feels very structured. It has that nice, really Rails 2 structure feel, but without all the complexity that now comes with you know default Rails. And But the, a lot of the code in there is kind of messy, and I feel like it would kind of benefit from more people kind of looking at it and figuring out maybe better ways of handling things because a lot of their features are built on top of um, kind of like Sinatra before filters, uh, conditions, Sinatra conditions, and rack middleware. Mm-hmm. And so kind of that there's there's some weird issues, for instance, when you want to like disable CSRF protection on like certain routes only. So, yeah, um, really awesome project. The other one also is the ROM project, Ruby yeah. Object, Object Mapper. Um, Where is that? That I'm like been waiting for that I know, forever. I know. Same here. Um, and basically I've been like always talking with the developers and I'm usually very skeptical because uh, they kind of tend to take principles to the extreme. And mm-hmm. this kind of results in a lot of kind of like uh, excess code that is more kind of writing the code to uh, comply with the style checker or the code complexity scanner or, um, you know, something like that. Or So I've been going, I've been slowly going through that project and just sort of like making small pull requests, but I kind of, you know, I'm just yeah. one person trying to undo complexity and that's usually hard once it's like, built, uh, you know, once yeah, ROM, ROM would definitely be on my list of, of projects to help with. I, I, I am like you, I would imagine I like I love using Sinatra and Data Mapper in the past. And so mm-hmm. like I've been waiting for ROM for quite a while now. Um, oh yeah. Oh so, yeah, yeah. Because Data Mapper one definitely has its warts. Yep. Um but yeah, uh definitely check it out and try to contribute. Uh they're actually pretty close. They have read supports, but they're they still need to uh get uh write supports. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, so the I guess the last project I'd have to say uh, worth checking out is MRuby. MRuby is really well designed, I would have to say, of kind of embeddable languages. I've been, I was looking at those a couple of years ago, and it seems like every kind of language that claims to be embeddable is basically more designed to be installed onto a system and then loads its additional modules via extra shared libraries. And MRuby is really interesting. It has its own little build system that compiles all it's split into all of its features are split into what are called MRB gems and then those are all compiled down into one single static linked library that you can then embed into other programs and so man it's really nice and it has actually pretty decent documentation around it uh, but like there's not a lot of projects around it so you do have to do kind of your research and tinker around with the code mm-hmm. but uh, it's really well put together and I think it has huge potential in just uh Anywhere you could put Lua, uh, mm. the embeddable language Lua, you could probably put MRuby and do a lot more because, you know, Lua misses, it, it lacks certain thing, basic yeah. things like bitwise operators. Yeah. Cool. So the last question is uh, for a programmer hero or, or just somebody that's been really influential in your life to this point. Oh, man. Um, so I try to be really anti-hero because anti-hero worship, I feel like it really holds people back. Uh, when they're always kind of looking up to someone and mm-hmm. instead of something inspiring to, you know, improve themselves and challenge themselves. But I definitely have to say, like, uh, as as far as, like, programmer wisdom goes, I feel like uh, Dan Cub, who worked on the Data Mapper Project, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Piat Solnik, and then also uh, Marcus, I'm going to mispronounce his name, Marcus Schreibt, uh, M- MBJ, uh, he, he wrote <laughs> Mutants. Yeah, and uh, those uh, those people are kind of like the most interesting discussions about like design and you know when when, when principles are taken too far uh, when they're not applied like pretty much anything Solnik writes is like I pretty much agree with it. So those are kind of like they're 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 hip cats. They know yeah. what's up. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> awesome. Well, so I wanted to say thanks a lot for coming on the show. I think that this is a. Uh, 
I don't know, you kind of get the sense with, with Ruby switchers and just with the, this world that, um, we've, we've almost gotten as simple as we can get, but at the same time, it feels like we've got a far, uh, a long way to go. Right. I mean, your right. call to arms kind of sums it mm -hmm. up. Right. And that like the goal would ultimately be to not really need these things. And, uh, yep. so, you know, I think that we've got a long way to go here, but, but I like the, uh, the simplicity that you're aiming for. So, uh, once again, I just want to say thanks a bunch for joining us today. It was postmodern. Um, his uh, real name has been redacted, and uh, no, just kidding. Um, but yeah, no, for sure, we will uh, we'll uh, be back next week. Um, so make sure you listen. We are going to start doing this weekly again um, now that everything has started to settle down. Yeah. So back to live too. I think we're gonna be. Uh, if you're listening to this, obviously you are because you're hearing me say this. But uh, our uh, our new date is Friday live at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time. Um, if for some reason we don't, we don't have a guest, we're just going to get on there anyways and just talk about awesome open source. So we're, we're aiming for weekly live. Um, should be a fun time. And a post we've, we've uh, been playing some email tag for a bit too, trying to get you on the show and just echo Andrew's thoughts too. Just static, ecstatic to have you on the show. Uh, love the work you're doing in open source and just want to do as much as we can to encourage you to keep doing the awesome work that you're doing. Thanks, man. It was a fun time being on the show and hope to hear more awesome episodes out of you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, Andrew. Uh, yeah, that's it. So until next time, we'll just say goodbye. Bye-bye. Adios.